everyone. I'm Mark Andrews, the Senior Vice President of International Operations here at Habitat for Humanity International. Thanks for joining us today. Over the past few months, we've been hosting informative conversations about the importance of housing during COVID-19. If you've missed any of those events, I'd encourage you to take a look at the past conversations and, turn, and learn about COVID-19's impact on the intersection with housing. Today is a special day. We'll be, uh, we'll be talking about veterans' issues as they relate to COVID-19. As many of you know, tomorrow is the 51st, 51st anniversary of Veterans Day here in the U.S., a day that we celebrate the more than 18 million men and women who have bravely served our country. To all the veterans who are in the audience today, we thank you very much for your service. Um, we thank you for, for the investment that you've made in the democracy that uh, has made this country great. The transition from military life back to civilian life can be challenging for veterans. I know it was for me. Often finding jobs, navigating opportunities for education, and being able to afford decent housing can be really daunting experiences. Even with military benefits, accessing adequate health care can be difficult. And not receiving that care can and does result in homelessness, unemployment, and chronic health conditions. In the United States, veterans are facing instability unlike ever before. A 2018 report of post 9-11 veterans suggests that more than any other generation in the past, um, veterans are, are burdened with, with housing costs, spending more than 30% of their, their income and having to make very difficult choices about where they spend the rest of their, their income, um, sometimes in, in, for very basic necessities. With the coronavirus pandemic continuing to surge across the nation, it's, it's interrupted key services for veterans, increasing and making it even more difficult for veterans to get the support that they need and deserve. Um, as I mentioned before, I also am a veteran. I served 12 years in the Air Force, um, first as a, as a B-52 bombardier and navigator, um, a, a nuclear weapons expert, and then uh, as, a, as an intelligence officer um, commanding two units, one in, in Maine for the Strategic Air Command, and then on the island of Guam for the 13th Air Force. Um, I understand the complexities and the challenges that my fellow veterans face. Uh, my my reintegration was an interesting one, um, and one that I feel blessed to to have brought me to Habitat. Our guests today are going to talk about the impact of COVID-19 on the mental, physical, and emotional health of our veterans. We will also talk about the, how the pandemic has made access to essential services like housing even more challenging. And we'll really discuss what policy issues need to be addressed to make sure that veterans have a, a place to live that is decent and affordable. I'd like to introduce our, uh, our panelists today. First, starting with Stephen Peck, the president and CEO of US Vets, the nation's largest nonprofit devoted to providing housing and other essential services for at-risk veterans. Stephen started his career as a, as a first lieutenant in the US Marine Corps in Vietnam. He then transitioned to becoming a documentary filmmaker uh, after a series of films that, that he put together. Uh, it led him to the VA and to really helping the VA address homelessness and, and veterans in a, in a more systemic way. In 1996, he joined the organization that has become US Vets. He was appointed the president and CEO in August of 2010. Additionally, uh, joining us today is, is San Walker, the Manager of Programs and Strategic Partnerships at the Home Depot Foundation. As, as some of you may know, Habitat began our Veterans Build program to provide volunteer home ownership and, and employment opportunities for U.S. vets, military service members, and their families. The Home Depot Foundation has been a critical supporter of that work and uh, over the years has been the primary driver of, of our Repair Corps program and, and other work. Next, I'd like to introduce Corinne O'Connell, the CEO of Habitat for Humanity Philadelphia. 
Habitat Philly began doing critical repair work along with their usual new home construction about 10 years ago. Since then, the affiliate has helped repair 600 homes, 114 of which have been uh, for military service members. Welcome, Corinne. And lastly, um, really like to, to uh, welcome Anthony Luton, who is a, an Air Force veteran as well and a partner with Habitat Philly. Anthony will share his story of overcoming some of the obstacles that he's had in reintegrating back into the civilian world. And we'll hear about he and his partnership with affiliates, the affiliate there in Philly. So um, let's just jump in. And I'd like to start and really open it up to the entire panel. Um, as we've seen the coronavirus pandemic kind of surge back and forth across our country, from your perspectives, where have you seen that, that veterans are most uniquely impacted by, by this pandemic? Um, I'll jump in. Uh, we uh, realized that this pandemic could have a devastating effect on our population. Um, we house uh, around 5,000 veterans on any given night uh, at our 11 programs across the country and out in the community. Uh, and uh, we understood that once this uh, gets inside of one of these large facilities, some of our, our largest facilities have more than 500 veterans. And if that pandemic uh, got in there, uh, we would really be in trouble. Uh, we'd, uh, we'd suffer terrible uh, loss. So uh, we locked down uh, really early and have been very uh, diligent and, and probably a little lucky. Uh, uh, less than 1% of our veterans have uh, been uh, te have tested uh, positive. Uh, it, it, we create therapeutic communities. So the veterans working together, living together, support each other, move forward together as they lift themselves out of homelessness or substance abuse. And, uh, and we hope that they will eventually reintegrate into society. Uh, the, that therapeutic community has kind of been uh, uh, separated, uh, dislocated by this COVID because everyone's in their room alone. We're practicing social distancing, masks. A uh, number of veterans are not coming into our real rehabilitation programs. Those programs have two or three veterans to a room. They don't want to do that. They would literally prefer to stay homeless out on their own rather than come into a room in a congregate setting. So. Uh, uh, even though we have had very, very few uh, cases, uh, it has been a challenge. It has been a challenge to uh, really make that, that key, that important connection with the veterans in our programs. It's been a challenge to get veterans to come into the program. And uh, I, I, I think we've done everything we can do. I think this pandemic has really uh, just locked a lot of people down. Uh, they don't want to move from where they are, from where they're comfortable. So uh, we're continuing to do outreach and hoping that uh, uh, now that they seem to have identified a vaccine, uh, that will be uh, uh, back to normal or, or the new normal uh, next year. Thanks, Steve. And I think, I think we're all pretty excited about the potential for, uh, for the vaccine and for the ability to begin to to congregate again and to bring people together. Um, it, it, it's so critical. Uh, Son or Corinne, do you, do you have any? I, I was going to jump in, Mike. Uh, just as a, a funder, uh, I'm partnering with so many great nonprofits that are service, serving, serving the uh, veteran community. What we did is, you know, back in March, when we kind of realized this was going to be a pandemic. Uh, and it was going to impact the communities far more than we thought it would be, that it was going to. What we did is that we actually wanted to assess our partners uh, and we, we actually communicated with them to try to, to see what the need is, what, what do they think the need is for the veterans that they serve. And so what we wanted to make sure that they were, we gave them the opportunity because we were actually fighting for critical home repairs uh, for these veterans. Um, and as you guys know that, you know, a lot of contractors, a lot of veterans, a lot of the older veterans that we were serving were susceptible to the COVID. So they weren't really allowing veterans, uh, uh, allowing contractors into their homes. So what we 
uh, communicated with our uh, partners was, hey, let us know what, what, what is out there. Do you, do you need to, to reallocate these funds uh, to do food insecurities, uh, to pay bills, or uh, to, to help veterans that also deal with PTS, that also deal with other mental uh, issues? How can we assist you guys as, as uh, grantees on, on taking care of these veterans? So we, we work with a couple of our uh, partners to reallocate funding. Uh, up to 300000 to say, hey, we're not going to do repairs for the next two to three months, but we do know that these veterans need to have their bills paid. They need critical finance assistance, uh, assistance with mortgages, their spouses. They have lost their jobs, and they, they are not able to even go to their, their, their VA uh, appointments. So we allowed our partners to reallocate those funds to support that because that's another obstacle that plenty of our veterans had to deal with because they already had some of the mental stressors that they have to deal with after their service. But what do they do in a pandemic and how could we partner and strategize with our uh, grantees to make those those obstacles a, a little bit more easier to jump over? So we, we actually did that for six months uh, to make sure that our partners could, could address those needs. But they are the subject matter experts, so we want to make sure we listen and they reallocate those funds to support their needs. Thanks, Tom. You know, I, I think that uh, that's it's such a gift for us for when donors are willing to be flexible in a situation like this. Um, obviously, we at Habitat, and I'm sure, Stephen, at in your organization as well, um, there's things that have opened up and there are things that have closed down in terms of our ability to 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 deliver on the, the funding that you've given us. And um, the the opportunity to use those funds more flexibly and to address the needs of the, the people that we serve is really important. So thanks for thanks for the flexibility. Corinne, could could you talk a little bit about what this has done at the Habitat affiliate level? Sure. Um, so thank you all for um, uh, inviting Habitat Philadelphia to be here today and to Stephen and Anthony and Mark for your service. Um, and so on certainly, so 114 uh, veterans homes are repaired in Philadelphia and that's because of the Home Depot Foundation. And I don't say that in the space of like, you know, this is the big guy who makes decisions around that, but that's in lives changed uh, because of the investment you've made. So thank you. Um, you know, at the, at the, you know, boots on the ground level, there, the challenges are on many levels. So the first few weeks, uh, certainly in the pandemic was how do you, how did we keep even Habitat team members safe in addition to, so we had to pause uh, for a number of weeks on critical home repairs uh, until we had systems and processes in place, both for team members, but then as well as the recipient family, right? So before we could go into Anthony's home, you know, will our team be safe? Will the contractors that we're working alongside, will the veteran, the veterans' families uh, be safe? So um, to pause, that was really hard, knowing just how critical those repairs are. Like it just felt like this compounding challenge. Um, so thankfully we are back in motion on critical home repairs. It is a much slower process because of the safety precautions that have to be taken for everyone. Um, and when we talk with both veterans and, you know, families where we are repaired, they get it, right? Like in just that space of they too want the confidence of when they go to bed at night that there hasn't been a higher risk or they haven't had to take higher risks as, as well as for uh, Habitat team that are doing the repairs. I think in the, in the much bigger, what we're all talking about, housing is a health indicator, be it vets, be it kids, be it, you know, whomever's in the home. Um, and so the pandemic has put just such a spotlight or just shown like just how fragile people were. Mark, you said at the beginning, right, that the, you know, the highest percentage of post 9-11 vets who are in the most unstable or, you know, the highest uh, folks needing stable veterans, needing stable housing. Well, the pandemic only exacerbates it. It just, I mean, we're all nodding in that space, um, but from mental health, uh, physical health, like so on down the health indicator list. Um, and so I've been saying, you know, here in Philadelphia that there's an opportunity and there's an obligation. 
we've got to do this differently. Um, Philadelphia, we have 121,000 existing homes. There's an existing housing stock, um, and the most cost-effective, you know, affordable home is the existing one that's there. Uh, so thanks to, again, Home Depot Foundation and others who have stepped up to say, okay, let's go after it from, you pick the, you pick the population, veterans, children, asthma, diabetes, you pick it, but let's go after it with housing as the, as the prescription to uh, better help. Thanks, Corinne. Thanks very much. Um, I, I, I do know that Habitat affiliates across this country and, and our national organizations around the world have really struggled with trying to deliver on our traditional business model of, of using volunteers and other things to be able to get the work done. Um, it's a huge challenge. Um, Anthony, I, I'd like to shift to you because I think you, you can talk both to the challenges of uh, of dealing with having multiple people in your home um, and the the challenges and rewards of, of partnering with a, with a Habitat fil affiliate in in the form of Habitat Philadelphia. So Anthony, could you could you fill us in a little bit on on your perspective? Hey everyone. Um, thank you um, for what you guys shared for me. Um, uh, it it confirmed uh, exactly what what I experience. Um, housing is definitely uh, a health indicator. Uh, I had uh, my mother had passed away, and I had this property uh, to myself, and there were some uh, needed repairs. Uh, I couldn't get insurance on the house because of the old wiring, and so one day I just googled. Uh, veteran needs help with property. And that took me to Home Depot. Mm. And Home Depot referred me to Habitat. And uh, from that point on, um, I mean, just things have been getting better. Habitat came in and completely rewired the place. And I was able to get uh, my own insurance coverage on the property once they did that. Um, they made that place safe. Um, they tightened up all of the railings to make the walkways uh, safe. Uh, they um, took out all of the molded drywall that was in the basement. Um, I mean, there were there were people in the basement. I think uh, a group of gentlemen, four or five gentlemen, about in their seventies, and they're down there ripping out these walls and doing this work. And Habitat originally told me, "Well, you just need to let us get access. You don't need to be there." But I couldn't let these guys do all this work. It showed me up. So uh, from that point on, I started to volunteer with Habitat. Um, I'm great at demo. I can destroy some stuff. I mean, I have a history of that. But um, it's at that point that I think the light bulb went on, um, that helping others helped me. And um, the place was empty uh, before Habitat came. And once Habitat was done here, um, I was able to fill all the rooms in the house and they're presently filled with veterans. Um, and so we're able to help one another through this uh, struggle, this uh, readjustment period. And, uh, you know, this COVID thing did sort of cut us out from maybe outside access, but also forced us to, you know, sort of deal with each other inside. Um, and so, in one way, it may have been bad. In another way, it helped us to grow in other areas. And so um, at this point, um, my little contribution compared to what you guys do is it, small. Um, but I see that no matter what scale you do it on, um, you know, helping others uh, is a way to help yourself. Anthony, thanks so much. That's. Uh... And please don't underestimate your contribution. Um, you know, you are you are paying it forward in a way that that most people can't. And the fact that you have allowed other vets to join you in your house that is that is as good as it gets. Thank you. Um, that's that's very cool. Um, let, let's move on for a minute, and then I, I do want to circle back to Anthony. But um, Stephen, you know, you've you spend an awful lot of time in this space. Um, what are the policy changes, the things that 
that you're advocating for and, and your organization is advocating for to try to address some of these things? Because I think COVID has, has unearthed a lot of things that were already there, a lot of issues that were already in place, made them worse, um, but certainly uh, COVID didn't originate these, these problems. No, you're absolutely right. It is it has laid bare a, a lot of the systemic issues that have contributed to uh, the large number of homeless in this country and uh, homeless vet veterans in particular. Here in Los Angeles, uh, sadly, we are the homeless veteran uh, capital of the country. We have still have more than uh, 4,000 uh, veterans who are homeless. Uh, and when COVID hit, uh, the count, a lot of people stepped up, uh, as, uh, as, you, as you've uh, alluded to. Um, our reputation, uh, fortunately, uh, preceded us and people called us and said, you know, what are you doing? How are you taking care uh, of uh, these uh, veterans? And, uh, and that money came uh, really uh, unrestricted so we could spend it on the things that we uh, needed to. Uh, but uh, they also... Uh, uh, the, um, the, the VA has stepped up with uh, grant per diem funding uh, and uh, uh, a number of uh, other uh, funders. So we're able to uh, uh, do the things that uh, we need to do to uh, uh, help these veterans. Uh, homelessness is not only a lack of housing, it is lack of mental health counseling, it is a lack of substance abuse counseling, it is a lack of employment. So all of those things are underfunded, everything. So if we're, we're, as we come out of this, there's going to be even a greater need for, to get people back to work, uh, to treat people's um, uh, emotional distress during this. Uh, this isolation is not helpful to veterans who are isolated, uh, who really need the kind of therapeutic community that we and others uh, provide. Uh, and uh, helping guys get back to work is going to be critical. They're going to have to get back to work so they can afford housing, all right? So all those things go together. Uh, Los Angeles uh, uh, leased a number of hotels, housed more than, I think, 4,000 people. That money's running out, right? So they're, they're slowly shutting down those hotels. So we know, we know that we cannot build our way out of this. We, all of these other systems, all these other safety net systems need to be in place in order for us to continue driving down uh, the uh, homeless population. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. You know, that that's, that's such an important point that we can't build our way out of this. Um, it, there does have to be this this complete kind of bringing together the, the, the entire housing ecosystem around how, how do we address this? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think what, uh, what we continue to see is that when there's a gap in one area, it has it has knock on effects throughout the, the whole system. Um, <laughs> You know, one of the questions, and, and actually it's one of the questions that's come up in the chat. So I'd like to kind of pull this together um, and and maybe include Son, Corinne, and, and Stephen in this. Could you talk through how funding gets to, to an individual veteran? Um, and maybe, Son, we could start with you in terms of how the Home Depot allocates the funding. And then Corinne and, and Stephen, maybe you could talk about how you actually identify veterans and, and kind of move into the into the field. Yes, uh, thanks, Mark. So with, with the foundation, and especially with my population, my other colleagues' population, I manage the national partnerships. So you're looking at about uh, 14 partners, about eight of them around the housing space. So you may be uh, a couple of my partners, they actually build smart homes for combat uh, wounded veterans. You have my other five critical home aging in place partners that do all the home modifications. So uh, Habitat for Humanity International, Simplify Fund, several other uh, uh, housing organizations. And our funding is directly uh, in their annual uh, grants with our national partners. What we do and, and what I love about our partnership uh, with our nonprofits is that we actually are not just funding them. We, we're actually sitting alongside them to strategize uh, the best way to serve this extraordinary population that needs it and, 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 and deserve it. And so we make sure that I uh, uh, give you an example with uh, Veterans Bill with uh, the Repair Corps program. 
we sit alongside them 90, 90 days prior to the grant. We talk about their successes, some of the things that we need to build upon, what they're forecasting as far as the actual affiliates that are, want to be engaged in that repair core program, and then also how many veterans that are still out there that are needing these assistance. To go back to Stephen's uh, point, doing these critical home repairs prevents a lot of our veterans from being homeless because some of those homes may not be up to code if you don't get the roof done, if you don't get the, the floors done, if you don't get the uh, stairs, and all the things that go on inside of the, uh, the interior of the home. If we're not partnering with some of the great uh, nonprofits to fund those uh, homes to get those critical repairs done, a lot of those veterans will be homeless. The families will be homeless. Uh, and then that will impact the mental, the physical, what I love is the, the partnership in, in, in with Habitat and your passion around our values as well, giving back, taking care of not just your people with inside Habitat, but the people that you serve, but also just doing the right thing. What we're doing as a partnership with US Vets, with Philadelphia Habitat, and I, and I love Philadelphia Habitat, I, I, one of my favorite affiliates. Um, it is partnering with organizations that have the passion, the intellect, the strategy around understanding that veteran population, understanding the need, but then also how to, 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 to resolve those issues. So I think if we're not having these great nonprofits to partner with, we couldn't do the work. So we need Habitats. We need uh, Simplify. We need uh, U.S. Vets. We need those organizations to be able to to strategize with and take that funding and make that impact in those communities. And then I would just jump in and say, you know, on the, again, at the boots on the grounds level, to use a little military reference for y'all. Um, so that grant comes through Habitat International uh, to Habitat Philadelphia. We have an application process. We right now have an open call. We have a few more slots left for funding for uh, veteran repairs in Philadelphia County. Um, we go out and assess the home and, you know, it's got to kind of meet that sweet spot of not far, you know, like Anthony's house, for example, that that home, we, that it could be salvaged with the grant that was available. Um, the electrical, the range in the kitchen, the mold out of the basement, the railings, the wiring, et cetera. We go through in figuring out the scope of safe, warm, dry. What are the critical systems, what are the critical things that need to happen in this home for the veteran and the veteran's family to continue to safely live in this home? Um, so it's got a, you know, there's a sweet spot there. Sometimes a roof has leaked too long and the house, you know, really no one should be living there and it is not salvageable. So trying in that space of, it's not preventive repairs, we're not in that space, but preventing further damage from happening. Um, yeah, so. I would say for a local audience listening right now, certainly I love Anthony's suggestion, right? He Googled veterans repairs. I think that was it. And it popped Home Depot Foundation and then it went Habitat. So certainly look um, US Vets to see, um, you know, Stephen, uh, the project that you're working on for how many housing units you had said, permanent housing units? Yeah, 1600 units. That's amazing. Uh, so what's the local and for people in Philadelphia County, all of the resources as to how to apply are on our website, habitatphiladelphia.org. Another thing too, Mark, we, we, we have, as you guys know, our associates Team Depot, which is our volunteer arm of what we do. And a lot of them, and, and with the, the pandemic, we were shut down with Team Depot and we know that they were quite busy with volunteering with grants with our uh, with Habitat and our other nonprofit partners. And they are there to do all of these different types of volunteer projects. So if it's painting, if it's put into a fence, if it's doing landscaping uh, of our different partners, uh, uh, different communities and, and, and different nonprofits. So they're back in the fray again. They're, they're getting uh, at phase two, where now they're able to have at least uh, 10 of our uh, Home Depot associates to be to, to be able to take part in exterior uh, uh, unoccupied homes uh, to be able to now give back because they they have been just clawing over each other asking me other colleagues when can we get back out there uh, to, to to help uh, with our veteran populations and, and to give back and, and, and just work alongside some of our great nonprofits so that's another avenue 
uh, for funding and also volunteer engagement, which remember volunteer engagement equates to funding as well. And so that's another way that the foundation likes to make sure that they give back and, and make our uh, grantees aware that is another avenue of, of funding stream as well. Yeah, I, I, I really appreciate the focus of uh, the Home Depot Foundation. Uh, they do housing, that's what they do. Right? There's all kinds of, there's various foundations that do a bunch of different things. Uh, Home Depot Foundation has a, has a laser focus on housing and I guess they have made contributions to virtually every one of our 11 sites. And uh, Team Depot has been out there uh, and they, they'll remake a place in a day. It's extraordinary. At our DC site, uh, number one, they, we, we, we got an initial grant from Home Depot to complete the funding that we felt we needed. Uh, a, a, a year went by, uh, the construction didn't happen, various things happened. We needed more money. Mm -hmm. uh, we went back and said, we're, you know, we, we, we need a little bit more money here, and they gave it. And then their team came out, it must have been 50 or 60 uh, people at Home Depot, uh, uh, put the lawn uh, around the building in uh, Washington, D.C., put a fence around it, uh, built a barbecue area. I mean, they really made it into a home for the 80 veterans that lived there. So uh, that, that you know, having that knowledge of the situation, of the kind of multifamily housing that we build, and making that focused uh, contribution really was uh, critical. I mean, that, our DC site literally wouldn't be there without uh, Home Depot. That's great. And, and you know, it is interesting. Um, having s skilled volunteers can can just move things so quickly, um, and and advance projects that that you thought were going to take years. Mm -hmm. um, but but we have a we have another question um, that is is less about skilled volunteers. Um, the question is, I'm a I'm a disabled veteran who still wants to serve. I'm inspired by Anthony's story. How can I help? Maybe I'll start with you, Corinne, and then we go back to Stephen. And ultimately, I'd like to end up with Anthony on this because I think he's already living it out. Well, Anthony said it best, right? And being service to others uh, is, you know, the reward comes back around. Um, I would encourage that vet to um, punch in habitat.org, find their local affiliates. Um, and uh, what volunteer opportunities are there at their local affiliate. I can say at Habitat Philadelphia right now, there is a limited, again, in that space of COVID and safety. So we have a limited number of slots a day. Um, but as things, you know, as, as vaccines, as we move our way through, more opportunities will present themselves again. Um, in non-COVID times, there's office, you know, filing and data entry. There's the restore. Don't forget, you know, help unload trucks or help run up, uh, you know, uh, shoppers at the checkout counter. There's work on the traditional construction sites, on repair sites. So there is a, a wide variety. Serve on a committee. Um, you know, in this, in particular, thinking about veterans and recruiting veterans for this program. I think Stephen and Anthony, you had both alluded to this, um, but that veterans talking to veterans and engaging them in what opportunities are available is the most powerful way. So perhaps that's a way that that individual could help recruit other uh, vets into housing programs, into the critical home repair programs, um, right there in their local with their local habitat chapter. So that's how I would answer that one. If I'm going to add real quick, Mark, uh, me, I, I, I'm a veteran as well. Um, I spent a little over 20 years, retired about almost 10 years ago. Uh, so I'm getting up there in age, but still feeling good. But um, uh, to the, the, the veterans uh, question, as you can see, disabled veteran served. Veterans still want to serve. They want to have a purpose uh, to give back. Um, I, I would advise uh, the veteran to, to reach out to T. Rubicon, reach out to the mission continues, reach out to those great veteran service organizations that partner with uh, organizations like Habitat and other organizations to, to, to make you have that sense of purpose again, uh, uh, to, to be a comrade, work with your comrades again, to get that knowledge, whether it's employment, whether it's housing opportunities, uh, whether it's just having that connection again. But definitely, connect with those organizations that are still wanting to get out there and volunteer. And to be honest, 
when I started my path after my retirement, um, it was volunteering. And then I started making my connections and, and getting back involved in those communities. And that's how I got connected to Habitat. That's how I got connected to the Home Depot Foundation, because it was volunteering and, and establishing it in those uh, those relationships. So go that route, and I, and I guarantee you, uh, you won't be disappointed. And then there'll be that uh, stepping stone for you to, to, to get back out there and volunteer and give back. Thanks, Sam. Anthony, I, I kind of want to come back to you because it, it feels like you you stepped into this role by bringing other veterans in into your house. How did you how did you connect with those other vets and um, kind of what motivated you to do that? Well, um, the truth is, um, a part of my recovery process uh, involves other organizations and other fellowships, and to be honest. Um, having concern about my fellow man is a new thing for me. Um, I don't have a history of that. But uh, there's no doubt that um, I actually experienced the benefit of helping someone who's struggling. Regardless of what I'm personally going through, um, I have enjoyed the benefits of being there for someone who's struggling, uh, even my struggles. Either my struggles don't seem so big after all, or somehow they get resolved. But um, helping someone who is struggling um, has been beneficial uh, for me. And uh, this is a new skill that um, is new to me. And so I'm just practicing it as much as I can, as often as I can, so I can get better at it. Um, the thing is, I, I remember some commercial, uh, an Army of One, you know, there's no such thing. You know, we all need somebody to watch our six. And and we need this veteran. You know, we need this veteran to watch my six. And I'll watch his six. And if he will just come on in and volunteer, we get honest about what we can and what we cannot do. But chances are you have a skill, you have ability that will be useful. Uh, in, in this process. And so please, yes, make that contact, make that connection, because we need you. As the civilian on here, you all need to explain to the rest of the civilians watching and listening, uh, what's the connotation of to be the six? Well, that's an Air Force term. And so for those flyers, of course, I didn't fly. They wouldn't trust me with the aircraft. But uh, for those flyers, it's a uh, one plane watching the other planes uh, back. And I think, a lot of, I think a lot of people can uh, follow uh, Anthony's example. I know um, uh, as a veteran, the work that I'm doing now is, is very therapeutic for me. I mean, you know, I spent all my life working for other veterans. That's really, really important. And uh, what Anthony did, becoming a veteran peer, uh, is really important these days. And it's being recognized more and more as a way to connect communities together. Uh, we've only relatively recently started a peer program here in Los Angeles. And I think now there are uh, 100 veteran peers and it's uh, growing. Our system is very large. Our support system is large. It's hard for uh, uh, for homeless veterans in a community. It's hard for them to navigate this system, and to have that veteran peer there who maybe has been there, done that, can help them. You know, right? They 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 they'll attach themselves to a veteran until that veteran uh, uh, gets to where he or she needs to be and gets the services that he or she needs to be. And that's that's really critical. And just a vet to vet is, uh, as Anthony said, is one of the most powerful ways that uh, that we heal each other. Thanks. I would jump in. Sorry, Mark. I have one more comment. And um, we repaired, um, it was a veteran um, probably three or four years ago, um, Pam and Brian. Um, he had served in Vietnam, Purple Heart. Um, they had bought the house when they had gotten married. And, you know, as they aged and trying to keep up with the home, um, and as the roof went, they, they talked about when we got there to do the repairs that they had the weather channel on 24 hours in their in their house going because they had their raincoats and the blue tarps on hand to tarp the back of the house for when the rain came through. Um, 
So the vet to vet piece is so powerful. My tangent here is Pam, the wife, right? Who also, right? Her husband is the vet, but the relief she and her grown daughters, right? Experienced as well. Um, Brian, yes, the care he was receiving through the VA, but that the peace of mind the family also experienced because of the repairs to that home. So there's that also that ripple effect of other family members who both love and support that vet and um, helping to strengthen the stability of family units. Um, and I just remember her saying, um, Son, you'll appreciate this, because um, we had had Team Depot folks out volunteering with us when they were done. It took about six or eight weeks, that project. She talked that she wanted to put the Habitat and the Home Depot Foundation folks like on her mantle like graduation photos and like momentous things but she was like their family this feels like family that you know we stepped in and that space of working alongside um so that I, again i come back to that notion of the ripple effect of other family members that also have that sense of uh stability when the homes when the veterans receive those repairs thanks corinne and, and you know i i i want to call out we we sometimes have a tendency to think about veterans as, as men, and it's critically important to remember that there are an increasingly large number of female veterans who face very different kind of situations. Um, and, and so I, I just wanna make sure we, we don't forget uh, those female vets who, who have served their country on an equal footing with, with men. Um, I, I'd like to pivot for just a second here we just went through an election. Hopefully, it's behind us. Um, the, uh, the there there is a lot that can be done on the federal, state, and local level. Um, I'd like to open it up to to all of you to talk about what you see at at the federal, state, and local level in terms of of the real focus over the. And we touched on this a little bit, but specifically, what are the things that um, that need to be addressed um, starting at the federal level. And, and I think this ties a little bit to the previous question um, in terms of, of volunteer opportunities. Uh, certainly we at Habitat encourage our volunteers and our supporters to also become advocates for the cause. Um, but it, it, it is a unique opportunity, particularly in this environment where People may not be able to get out and, and meet face to face with veterans or go to a build site. Advocacy is an enormous opportunity. Um, so I guess I, I the question to all of you would be, what do you see at the federal, state and local level that we really need to focus on? I think for me, and I, I'm a big, I, I love the advocacy part. That's why we love funding Habitat on the Hill because you guys do great advocacy work around not just, you know, just veterans, but housing, affordable housing. But I think, and, and you mentioned it, uh, Mark, um, we need to really start advocating about the benefits that can better, that the education benefits for veterans to understand and how to maneuver uh, financial literacy, how to, how to maneuver home ownership, how to maneuver if it's not a home that you want to own but if you're getting a rental property how do you because everybody's not a homeowner how do you maneuver that aspect of transitioning from the usual of being on a military installation or whatever it is uh, that you have that you're, that you're accustomed to but then being able to teach someone a veteran how to advocate within the local level at the state level but also and what you guys do a great job when you guys bring the families at Habitat on the Hill, show them how to advocacy, advocate on their behalf. But I think people are learning how to do that. To me, I think that's an art. Right? You know the laws, the different policies uh, around the things that you want to advocate for. I think a couple of things when I look at the, the federal and things that I'm trying to, to, to have our colleagues at the foundation advocate for is to address uh, the lack of attention to the female veterans but then also the lack of attention to our Native American veterans that, uh, that are on these reservations that have served all the way from uh, World War I all the way up to uh, the wars that we have now. But I think we need to be able to understand, first of all, how you advocate, who needs 
advocacy, who we need to advocate for. Uh, and then also, again, those benefits that those veterans need to, to go to the next level, uh, to own those homes, whether it's rural, urban, in the city. How do you actually maneuver that system? Because we all know there's so much red tape out there, but how do you maneuver it? Uh, homelessness is a, a national problem, but the solutions are local. So, uh, uh, you know, we've received um, help from every administration. Veterans, helping veterans is not a political issue, unfortunately. It is a national issue. Uh, and what we continually advocate is that let give the communities as much flexibility with the funding as you are able. Because Los Angeles differs from Phoenix, differs from Washington, D.C. Uh, so uh, every system looks a little bit different. There are weaknesses and strengths within every system. Uh, but allowing uh, the nonprofits to work with those communities to come up with a, with, a, with a tailored solution for the demographics in that community, um, I think is really important. I, I think what we're going to, part of what, uh, we're going to learn out of this pandemic is that uh, uh, telehealth is going to allow us to reach many, many more veterans. We hope to get back to normal. We hope to to be able to uh, encounter, uh, deal with veterans one on one. Uh, that's the most uh, healing part of it. But meanwhile, we've gone to telehealth. We've strengthened our ability to to uh, speak to veterans uh, uh, over their computer or, or uh, over you know over the phone and we'll continue that because some veterans can't get to us. Uh, our, our employment program uh, uses uh, a lot of uh, uh, distance learning and uh, distance connection, placing veterans uh, all over the states that we're in. So um, I'm hoping that we will continue to strengthen that. Uh, there's always more employment money needed uh, but again, letting those communities use that money where they feel is, it'll have the greatest impact in uh, getting veterans off the street. And I would offer, um, I take a, you know, y'all are, you all are veteran experts. Um, I take a holistic view at housing. Um, and I think we have to fund it adequately at the federal level, the state level and the local level. And when you look at like, so be it the VA, be it HUD, um, but when you look at what funding levels were and where they are now and where that is, you know, factor inflation in there, um, you know, Philadelphia Housing Authority is up and against is against an impossible task. Of course, there's a 45,000 person waiting list because there is the money is not there to do what needs to be done. So I would hope that, you know, in this as a refresh that we look at, um, it's not one solution. It's not just HUD. It's not just the federal government. It's not just the Home Depot Foundation. I think there's going to, you know, the the cliche of like in this space, where are the innovative ideas um, that are going to emerge? And just as I'm standing here, as I'm thinking, you know, like, OK, veteran struggling with housing at the VA with funding from the Home Depot Foundation with Habitat, right? Like suddenly that changes the dynamic, like write the script for housing and then let's go after employment, let's go after mental health, let's go after, um, but certainly, you know, I'm wearing my Habitat, I'm wearing my Habitat hat, Mark, uh, but in that space to me, housing is really foundational. Um, to the holistic solution for people to be able to thrive, you need a decent place to live that is safe, that is stable, that is consistent. Um, so I would really hope that we as a country, and yes, locally, each community step forward with that commitment. Um, you know, who's our six? Who's the six that we're taking care of? Six neighbors, this side, this side, this side, and this side. Well, I would, I, I'd like to chime in to say that, um, I mean, <laughs> serving your country that's a you know home depot has to step up uh, habitat has to step up but these people didn't serve for you guys they served for the nation and i think the federal government needs to really you know put up enough lip service you know you you find money for whatever you need take care of these veterans and i'm i'm just i'm just going out on the limb here um Maybe if more people served, maybe uh, veterans would get a, a, a better, 
treatment. <laughs> um, uh, some countries have, you know, mandatory service. If everybody has to put two years in, you know, maybe your opinion about veterans will change, you know, when you become one. You know, so um, there's some things that the federal government should really look into. And, and this thing about the struggle to um, return to civilian life, the military has this process that they put civilians through, that they've been doing for hundreds of years. But when they're done with the soldier, they don't reverse this process. They don't debrief these people. They send them back home as if they're just supposed to become civilians again. These people are back here masquerading as somebody's son or husband or, you know, wife, daughter. They're still soldiers back here in civilian life, you know, hyper, uh, you know, extend. It's like, wow. You know, I think the government, if you're going to affect these civilians the way you are, you should really be putting some thought behind how you can reverse that or maybe somehow make make the return to civilian life uh, easier. And I uh, think you just said what a whole bunch of us were thinking. Uh oh. For sure. Without a doubt. <laughs> yeah, thank you. It's uh you know I I I was fortunate um in my Return to the civilian world. I, I actually found found a pathway that that led me to Habitat. But you know, as I as I recall that process, it's like, how do you explain to an employer what it is to be a nuclear weapons expert? Like, mm -hmm. how does that translate? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, those kinds of things are are the things that all of us veterans have have confronted um and then you you add on to that um the 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 health issues the mental health issues that that many of us have have incurred as a as a result of our service and as you said um it does seem like country probably ought to do a better job of of taking care of folks who have done such incredible service for all of us. So thanks for that. Thank you. Sorry to editorialize. Um, we are toward the end of our time. We've got about five minutes left. I, I just want to open it up to all of you. If there's anything else that you want to add before we close out. Well, I'd like to say thank you to all of you guys. Um, it's a healthy house now. <laughs> That's awesome, Anthony. That makes me super happy. And you have, at every turn, as you said, you're, you know, you're really good at demo, but you're, you know, every time we ask, you step up to the habitat plate. So thank you. I'm, um, back. I'm, back. I'm gonna borrow. Um, we have an amazing councilwoman, Helen Gim, who comes from the community organizing space, and she recently was on a panel with me. And when we got to this, her call to action was, give grow and go, right? So give dollars, give what you can, grow the coalition. Who else, you know, where else does the conversation need to happen about the space of veterans and housing and housing instability? Who else, how do we grow the coalition and then go take action? Um, so I really love that, give, grow and go. Well, I, I just wanna say from, the, from myself and the Home Depot Foundation um, and to Steve and Mark, Anthony, you guys are my brothers uh, in service. Kern, you are my sister in service. Uh, and as you said, and as everybody knows, we can't accomplish anything with just veterans doing things for veterans. We have to make sure that we bring in our brothers and sisters that are non-veterans that haven't served to educate them about what we've gone through. But it's also incumbent on them too to really understand the veterans transitioning. And I believe forums like this uh, will educate people to see that every veteran is not the same. Every veteran doesn't go through the same thing. There are hidden and there are visible scars. There are visible disabilities uh, that uh, several of us uh, have 
dealt with or some of us that are hidden uh, physical or mental disabilities that we have, but we've had to lean on either our spouses, our family members, or other uh, um, friends to get through it. But again, we can only accomplish anything in life if we collaborate with each other and understand each other. But again, thanks uh, Habitat for inviting me to, to join this call. Uh, great meeting you, uh, Stephen, and also great meeting you too, Anthony. And I don't want the uh, I don't want the day to go by without mentioning that it's the uh, Marine Corps birthday. We are 245 years old today. Um, uh, secondly, uh, these are. Uh, uh, community coalitions are critical. We are glad to do uh, the hard day-to-day -day work of getting veterans off the street, but we can't do that without an incredible uh, uh, organizing within the community. The communities that we're in, we are there because the community stepped up and said, yeah, we want you guys to come in and we'll help. So uh, it's really important uh, that the whole city and county get involved. Uh, California has stepped up. They've put up $600 million to build housing uh, for veterans. Uh, every state should be doing that. Uh, as Corinne mentioned, it's, uh, there's just not enough uh, housing out there. And uh, creating stronger systems, we have to talk to the county about the mental health system, about the employment system. Uh, uh, really, it takes uh, all of us to help uh, solve this problem. Thanks, Stephen. And thank you all. This has been an incredible conversation. I, I so appreciate all of your input. Um, you know, we we are all in the business of uh, of helping each other out, and um, it is wonderful to to kind of share this conversation with all of you. It's I hopefully has been uh, something that has been informative for the audience. Um, in closing, I would just like to ask each of you who are listening today and watching, um, when you wake up tomorrow morning, it's Veterans Day. Find yourself a veteran and say thank you. And thank you all very much. We, we look forward to continuing the conversation. Take care. Bye-bye.